Hi ladies and gents. In this section we're going to talk about the history of astronomy and then later on we're going to talk a little bit about telescopes. But astronomy has been a subject that has been done by humans for thousands and thousands of years and what we know today is to a great extent dependent upon what was found in the past. So we're going to start out talking about ancient peoples and most of what we're going to discuss is the history from the Western civilization, um, meaning the European civilizations, because that is the most direct path. Uh, be aware that a lot of, a lot of Asian uh, astronomers, a lot of uh, Pacific Islanders, Indian continent. There were a lot of extra work that was done in those arenas in the ancient past, but we don't have the time to go through all of them. So I'm just going to concentrate on the most direct path from what the ancient people were doing to what we're up to today. Those of you who have taken um, sort of a literature course where you've talked about mythology, uh, maybe you in a history course have talked about ancient Rome and ancient Greek. You may recall some of the myths and stories that were developed in order to describe what was going on in the heavens. Ancient peoples wanted to explain what they saw in the sky. And science had not been invented yet. And so in order to explain what they saw, they invented stories. And for example, uh, Apollo. Apollo was the god of the sun. And what made the sun go across the sky every day? Well, according to the stories in the ancient Greek and ancient Roman mythologies, it was Apollo had a golden chariot that he was dragging across the sky. What explained the motion of the moon and its changing phases night after night after night? Well, that was the daughter of Zeus named Diana or Artemis in the, uh, in the Roman tradition, the Greek tradition. And she is considered today even the goddess of the moon. When they were trying to explain things, they invented stories and deities to answer their scientific questions. By time 400 BCE occurred, there were a group of ancient Greek philosophers that said, you know, inventing gods and goddesses is not necessarily the most scientific way to figure out how nature works. And the people who did this were called philosophers. And philosopher is an old word that means lover of wisdom. Now you have heard of some of these ancient philosophers. Um, there's Plato, there's Socrates, there are many of them. And we are going to concentrate our efforts on one of these gentlemen, and his name was Aristotle. Aristotle was fortunate to be born in a time when this concept of philosophy, trying to explain nature without evoking gods or the supernatural, that was in vogue and that was what was being done when he was a young man. Aristotle proved to be incredibly influential in the history of physics, science, and astronomy for the next 2,000 years. And why? Why in the world does this one fellow have such a huge influence? Well, Aristotle said, amongst other things, he said he was going to try and explain nature, but he was also going to write everything down that he could possibly learn. Aristotle created sort of his very own, today it would be his very own Wikipedia. Uh, he absorbed all the knowledge that he could learn, tried to distill it, and rewrote it down. Those ancient writings persisted for many, many, many years. Um, his writings on science and nature dominated what we knew for a very long time. Now, one of the things that Aristotle taught that we now know is incorrect, but Aristotle taught that in the heavens, the bright glowing stuff was made of an element called quintessence. Quintessence does not exist. This was an attempt for ancient peoples to make sense out of things. Today, we would call this stuff quintessence plasma. Um, plasma is that fourth and highest state of matter. And it occurs whenever we get a substance so hot 
that the protons and the electrons in an atom start to separate from each other. And you see this every day in candle flames, um, electrical sparks as in thunderstorms, or if you just have a static electric spark when you rub your feet on the carpeting. But stars, a long way away, are so hot that they are made of this hot gas or plasma. When it came to astronomy, Aristotle and his colleagues taught things that to them seemed incredibly obvious. For example, the Earth is the unmoving center of the universe. Well, it appears like the unmoving center of the universe. Um, when you woke up this morning, it kind of appeared like you were standing on a solid ball that wasn't hurling through space at thousands of miles an hour. And the ancient peoples believed that. We were stationary and everything, planets, the sun, everything revolved around us. One of the other things that Aristotle and his colleagues believed was that all celestial motion was perfectly circular. There was something magical and there was something mystical about the circle. If the heavens is where the gods, gods plural or gods singular, existed, God is not going to live someplace that is shabby. So it had to be a place that was perfect. And they believed the circle was a perfect symbol for a couple reasons. One, it has no beginning. It has no end. It's a wonderful symbol for eternity. Um, people wear wedding rings because of the fact that this is a symbol of never-ending love. The reason why a king or a queen will wear a circlet on their head, as in a crown, is because this is the never-ending power and glory of that king or queen. So this mystical belief in perfect circles was used when they were trying to explain the orbits of planets in the sky. It's not true. Planets and things do not move in perfect circles, but they certainly thought so. Aristotle and his crowd thought that each individual planet, Mercury, Venus, Jupiter, Saturn, each one of those existed on a, a celestial sphere. This is one of the best pictures I could find, and that's not a really great picture. They sort of thought, like if you have a, a set of nesting bowls in your kitchen cupboard, one fits inside of the other, but they thought that each one of these bowls were clear or crystalline. Um, and that you can actually see through one sphere to the other. And if each one of these nesting bowls could slide and move compared to the others, situated on each one of these was a planetary object. The Sun, Jupiter, Mercury, Mars, etc. And all of these moved like a bunch of gears in a machine. And as they slid past each other, that is how they explained the motion of the heavens. They believed that the outside sphere contained holes in it, sort of like a kitchen colander. It will have lots of holes in it when you're trying to strain spaghetti. And they believed that they could see the divineness of heaven beyond, and that was the bright stars, that they were beyond the last sphere, holes in that sphere, a let, a, let us see the shine of those stars on the outside edge. It was also believed that if there was any sort of a change in the heavens, it was a big deal. Um, it was a foreboding. It was a premonition, a way of predicting the future. The heavens were the place where the gods lived, and so they had to be perfect. They had to be unchanging because the gods were perpetual, and the gods, as I said, are not going to live somewhere that is a little bit shabby. And so everything in the heavens had to be perfect. So if there was a change, that meant that the gods were sending a message. Uh, for a long, a long, long time, comets, uh, because comets appear to appear out of nowhere, uh, they and then they orbit the sun circle and disappear again. For years, they were considered prophets of doom and that bad things were going to occur because the gods were sending a message to Earth. This tapestry right here is known as the Bayo Tapestry. It was made about 1070, and clearly in this thousand-year-old tapestry, 
there is an image of Halley's Comet. It wasn't named Halley's Comet at that point in history, but it was considered a, a omen that something was going to happen. And shortly after that, the Normans conquered England and King Harold was actually shot in the eye by an arrow. That's a terrible way to go. One of the other things that Aristotle taught was that the moon was perfectly smooth. Um, now, you and I, because we've learned it our entire life, have learned that the moon is full of lots and lots of craters. But at that point in history, they didn't have telescopes. And they thought, what's the purpose of the moon? Well, it's for us. It's for mankind. So it was put in the heavens by the gods to help us. And how does it help us? Well, it helps us by going through phases and helps us tell time. But it also lights the night. And what's the best way for it to light the night? It reflects the sun's light back to the earth. And what's the best way for that to occur is to make the moon perfectly smooth. These teachings of Aristotle that we just went through were all wrong. And you might say, why in the world are we spending time on, on time stuff that is wrong? Well, in the history of astronomy, these wrong teachings of some of the ancients dominated science for about 2,000 years. Um, Aristotle lived around 400 BCE, and after the Greeks fell to the Romans, and the Romans conquered the Greeks, the Romans kind of adapted a lot of the works that had been done by Aristotle and his buddies as truth. And then when the Romans fell, we went through a period that were known as the Dark Ages. And during the Dark Ages in Europe, very little new science was done. I mean, it was a period of time where there was no local centralized government. It was, climatologists have told us during this period of time, it was a mini ice age. It was cold. It was a lot of famine. People were dying, lots of plagues. And in a situation like that, people don't spend a lot of time worrying about science when they're just trying to survive. And so these ancient, ancient teachings actually persisted for well into the 1400s, which is only about 600 years ago. So these wrong ideas for a long time were the best we had. But things are going to get better really soon. So we'll come back and talk more about that in the next section. Thank <laughs> you.